be discussing the Morgan Nick investigations in Alma, Arkansas on June 9th, 1995. So Morgan Nick was a six-year-old girl from Ozark, Arkansas. On Friday, June 9th, 1995, Colleen Nick, Morgan's mother, made grilled cheese sandwiches for dinner for her three children, Morgan, Logan, and Taryn. Colleen had plans that night to meet some friends and watch their kids play at a little league game in Alma, Arkansas, which was only 30 minutes away from Ozark. A memory that Colleen Nick specifically remembers about that night was that Morgan asked for a second sandwich, and Colleen didn't have enough time to make it, and typically Morgan wasn't a big eater, so she figured she'd be okay. But this is something that still bothers Colleen Nick to this day. Morgan and Colleen got ready for the game, and the two little ones, Logan and Taryn, were going to be staying at their grandma's house because Colleen thought, you know, it's late and it was a makeup game that night, which is why it was a little bit later than typical. Um, and there's a lot of kids going to be running around at the ball game, and there's, you know, she's got three kids, so she figured it'd be easier to keep up with one. Um, the ball field that Morgan and her mom went to, it was a smaller ball field. There was no concession stands, um, there was no bathrooms, there was just two bleachers, one on the first baseline and one on the third baseline. And there are kids running around everywhere. I mean, there's a double chain link fence that was wrapped around the field, and there's kids running back and forth the whole night, according to Colleen, and there's videotape footage of, you know, of proof of that, and kids biking around all over the field. Um, there's even an apartment complex that was backed up to the um, parking lot where um, this abduction occurred. From the bleachers, um, they opened up to this upper gravel area. It wasn't really a parking lot per se, it was more just kind of a gravel pit or gravel um, area where they used, the, they used this parking. Um, so it wasn't like a confirmed like parking spot. But So Morgan, she, the, she sat next to her mom the majority of the game. Um, she was described as being more shy and quiet. Um, so Morgan would, you know, she stayed right with her mom. She had a few friends of Morgan's were at, were at the game and they kept asking Morgan if she wanted to come play with them and Morgan kept saying no. But right before the game ended, the kids came back up to her and asked her if she wanted to go catch some fireflies. And for the first time that night, Morgan actually really wanted to go. So she asked her mom and Colleen said, you know, no, because it's, it's late, it's getting dark. Um, just no, not right now. Um, and Colleen started thinking about all the times her friends would tell her she was too overprotective, too overbearing. Um, and after watching the kids play the whole night, she felt okay with it and agreed and gave Morgan permission. But when Colleen looked up at the field or looked up at the, um, the parking area where they were going to be playing and catching fireflies, she had this gut-wrenching feeling that something just was wrong. But she kept telling herself, you know, it's ridiculous, um, I'm being ridiculous, and she gave Morgan permission, and excitedly Morgan was just threw her arms around Colleen's neck and kissed her cheek, and she took off running with her two friends, 8-year-old Jessica and 10-year-old Ty. As Morgan was running, she was, I think, the last one in the video that, um, as she was running, there was, she was like the last one in the, in the row of kids, and that was, that was the last time Morgan was seen by her mother ever. The three kids were playing in the sand pile on the back side of the parking lot overlooking the field and the game ended around 10.45 or so and the kids were heading back down and that's when Morgan sat down by Colleen's car and said that she was going to take the sand out of her shoes. Ty, he was 10 at the time and he stayed with Morgan until she finished tying her shoes and then he turned around and ran back down the hill and back to the, the bleachers and that was the last time Morgan Nick was ever seen alive. When Ty arrived back to the bleachers where Colleen was, Colleen saw him and saw that Morgan wasn't with him or Jessica and asked Ty and said, you know, where's Morgan? And he pointed back to the parking lot stating that she was taking sand out of her shoes. But Morgan wasn't there. And Morgan was only alone for approximately two to three minutes from the time that Ty saw her and from the time that Colleen looked up at the where Morgan was, was supposed to be. So Colleen walked up to the, the parking area to see if she could find Morgan because she wasn't in viewpoint. And originally she thought she was just out of view from the field and she maybe wandered. Um, but Morgan was gone and there was absolutely no sign of Morgan. She searched until about 11.07 when she notified police of Morgan's disappearance. According to police, originally some of the officers believed that it could have been a miscommunication between grandparents and parents with picking up a child. So 
you know, they weren't as concerned, but until like when they got there and they gathered information, they knew something there was more severely wrong. Um, the original search team consisted of police, parents, and just random citizens of Alma. Police organized a neighborhood canvas, hoping that maybe someone saw something from their homes, because they realized that the apartments were overlooking that area in particular. But no one saw anything. Um, they found some Coke cans and cigarette buds around the area where Morgan was last seen, and they collected everything that they could possibly find on the ground, hoping something had DNA or fingerprints on it. But there was no footprints, there was no tire tracks ever found of Morgan or the abductor. Ty, who was about 10, and Jessica, who was 8, it, they told investigators that they, a man had come up to them, and they described him as a white male, um, a scruffy beard and with had shorts on. They said that he had hair on his chest and some on his stomach. They also described him as having a red truck with a white camper that just didn't fit right. They said that the suspect was standing by this truck on, with the driver door open and smoking a cigarette at that time. Police sat with Ty and Jessica the next day and used identikits to come up with a sketch of the suspect that had not yet been identified. And identikits are kind of like, um, the only way I can explain it is kind of like a Sims character where you pick a face out of like whatever they have listed there for you. You pick whatever is most similar and then you pick the most, the most similar hairstyle and pick it. So it's not like an actual, you know, composite, a sketch composite made of your memory of what you say like someone looks like. It's, it wasn't like that. It was an identikit. Um, so John Nick, who's Morgan's father, he had no interest in talking to the media. Um, which is why you won't find much footage of him talking to um, in, in any interview or anything. Um, Colleen was more reluctant about the whole situation. She learned how to speak to the media and she learned how to kind of use them to her advantage to push Morgan's story out there more and more, to get more coverage on her, to get more information out, her and out, out there, um, which is what you need in cases like this. You need someone to push in the media to, get, to keep the story alive, keep Morgan's name alive. Um, and one day when John was at the police station, um, a lady with local media she and her camera guy, they pushed John out of the way to get to Colleen. And, you know, John yelled at them and fussed at them and said, you know, um, watch where you're walking. And she replied, you know, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. It's just nobody wants to hear what the dad has to say. Everyone wants to hear from the mother, um, which to me, I mean, I, that's so wrong on many levels to tell a parent whose child is missing that they're not important then what they say is not important because it's only this parent is more important. Um, home footage collected from June 9, 1995 at the ball game from parents that were just videotaping their kids playing. Um, they reviewed those footage, police reviewed those footage and they on that same day of Morgan's disappearance, I think it was around 5.30 or so when this, when this footage was taken, in the background, um, you can see a red truck with a white camper shell that was sitting there early in that day. The owner of that truck, nor the truck, has ever been found or identified. So after 24 years of no new leads and no movement in Morgan's case, Chief Russell Wright retired. Um, Jeff Pointer took over, and he came in with fresh eyes and ears and took in suggestions from other investigators. One of those suggestions was from Captain Hartley. He approached Chief Pointer about reviewing information gathered on June 9th, 1995, and to start from the beginning. Not to throw it all away, but just start and review everything from June 9th, 1995 at 11.07. So that's what they did. Detective Hartley was assigned as lead investigator in Alma in 2019. So three months after he took over as Chief, Chief Pointer, he called a meeting with the Nick family. There were over 8,300 leads in Morgan's case. Um, as of 2019. There are two composites created from Ty and Jessica the day after Morgan disappeared. In June 13th of 95, there was an attempted abduction outside of a laundromat and another composite was created. And on August 13th of 97, police had a new composite drawn and that was a combination of Ty and Jessica's identikit and the laundromat composite. Detective Hartley is no longer focusing on these composites. He's primarily focused now is that vehicle from that video. The suspect's vehicle from all the reports that Detective Hartley was going over and his team, um, they revealed that the red truck was parked near Colleen at the top of the hill.
From the, all the witness statements that Detective Hartley read from the 9 to 1995, that people viewed this guy, or this man, this suspect, leaning on the truck and watching the game and just sitting there watching. He would lean on the truck from time to time smoking a cigarette. But apart from Jessica, Ty, and Morgan, there is no connection between this suspect and any other kids on top of that hill. No one had any communication or connection with him besides these three kids. Detective Hartley pulled 20 witness statements regarding the red truck from that night. While reviewing that information regarding the truck, he gets to the 20th person and finds a photograph of that red truck with a white camper at the Alma Little League ball field on June 9, 1985 at 5.30 in the afternoon, and that was the same truck from that video. Police had this footage on either the 13th or the 14th of June that same year. However, media outlets stated that this, fat, this truck was in fact a Mazda and it was owned by one of the parents at the ball field. However, Chief White denied ever hearing this information and Detective Hartley states that there is no documented proof that this truck is cleared as a suspect. Detective Hartley reviewed all witness notes from that day of June 9, 1995 and now believes that Morgan was not the first person that came in contact with this red truck from that day. In the first location was a teenage white female who was walking on the side of this road. A red truck with a white camper shell drove past her, stopped, and reversed the truck back. He asked her if she wanted to ride to downtown Alma, the same location where Morgan would later be taken from, and she said no. The suspect does not leave, and the girl gets a little scared, obviously, and she feels that she's forced to leave and just walk away from the man. The second location was a call-in. Two girls, they were ages five and six, from the north side of Alma, who came running and crying from their front yard next to their street. Their mother looks up and sees a red truck with a white camper driving off. The third location was from downtown Alma. Teenage boys walking from the older baseball fields from the south side of West Main Street, a red pickup truck with a white camper show, stopped and the male sus suspect in the truck gets onto them about being in the street. And one of these witnesses watches him turn onto Walnut Street, and that's the, the street that runs parallel, parallel with the ball field that goes up into the parking deck where Morgan was abducted from. The fourth location was a group of 10-year-old boys seen on home footage at the game, biking and biking around the park. They report seeing Red Truck with a white camper shell stopping and yelling at them for being on the road as well. The fifth location is Morgan's disappearance. The sixth location is the video footage of the red truck with the white camper around 5.30 that same day. The seventh location was reported from 10 minutes from the time that Morgan went missing to when the, these group of teenagers saw this truck. They were driving around near a river when they saw a red truck with a white camper shell parked and one of the passengers stated that he felt that he observed a man holding down a child in the passenger seat. And after they learned of Morgan's abduction the following day, they came forward with that information. Alma PD went back to the site with those teenagers the next day. There's confusion on if it was the next day or a day, couple days after. But due to the flooding that occurred in 1995 on June 9th, they were unable to get to that location. So on the night of June 9th, after Morgan went missing, there was a, um, a huge thunderstorm came rolling in um, to Arkansas and there was about 32 feet of flooding. Um, so Hartley believes that there are three potential circumstances that could have occurred with Morgan's abduction. That Morgan left that location, or Morgan did not leave that location and is still there. Or the third possibility is that due to the flooding, that Morgan, and if Morgan was left on top of the you know, concrete and was not buried, that she was swept away over the river. The new emphasis on today's investigation with Detective Hartley is on this red truck with white camper shell. The first suspect in Morgan's disappearance is Charlie Ray Vines. His victim profile went from, I think, about 14 to 93 years of age. Police cannot rule him out as a, as a suspect in Morgan's case because if he went to 16 and 14, what says that he's not going to go down to 6? Detective Hartley made it, got, got a map together and was able to um, mark down all the locations where Vines was known to be living during the early 90s 
and then he marked out where all of the victims were. And all of these victims were reportedly close to Vines' home at the time. And at the time of Morgan's abduction, Charlie Ray Vines was active, and he was caught in 2000 after attacking a 16-year-old girl. Detective Hartley and his team, they set up an interview with Vines 19 years after his incarceration. Um, however, Hartley received a call from the prison saying that Vines was terminally ill with cancer and was currently in a comatose state and was not in a place to speak to law enforcement and then later died. Detective Hartley knows for a fact that Vines owned a red truck with a white camper shell because when he was on patrol back in, during that time period, he drove by it before. However, the timeline is the issue with that um, knowledge because they also received a tip that he did have access to a red truck with a white camper at the time, but they have not been able to verify that with any kind of registration. So it, it, it's not an invalid proof. Investigators searched Vine's property at an area where Vine's reportedly spent a lot of his time when he was alive. Um, investigators had cadaver dogs searched Vine's property as well as um, location number seven where witnesses stated that they saw the red truck with the white camper shell. The cadaver dogs did not alert to anything at location seven. At Vine's property, the three, in, three dogs independently hit at multiple spots on top of that hill where Vines reportedly spent a lot of time. So they dug up the spots, but nothing was, was found. The second suspect that they are looking at in Morgan's abduction and disappearance is Billy Jack Lynx. Two months after the abduction of Morgan, Lynx was arrested for sexual solicitation of a child at Sonic in Van Buren. And Van Buren was only about 10 minutes away from where Morgan was taken in Alma. An 11-year-old girl went to Sonic with her brothers and a friend to get a drink and some fries. Link pulled over to talk to the kids, but his main interest was her. He tried to give the boys some money to leave and to go get them something to eat or drink at the Sonic. He even was able to kind of lure them and, and kind of pull them away about two blocks away from the Sonic in his truck. Um, the little girl um, was then offered some money and he offered her money to come home with him. She said no, and then he had a very indecent conversation with an 11 year old girl. She was scared and she told them that he was that she was going to call the police. He knocks over his drink in the car and then drops his cigarette and tried to get her to come back to the truck to pick up the cigarette. She hollered to the boys to go to Sonic and to call the police and all of them turn around and take off running back to the Sonic. He gets scared, takes off in his truck and crashes. The kids heard him crash and watched him flood the scene. Someone sees the news regarding the attempted abduction at Sonic and he called police to report seeing a man in a red truck described in Morgan's case and in the attempted abduction talking to children. He observed this man while he was at the bank and he was talking to these kids and he decided that it was eerie enough and strange enough to write down the license plate. Um, so when the police ran it, it led them to Billy Jack Links. They obtained a search warrant. They searched his home and that truck and they found damage to his truck consistent with the reported crash. Um, so they had enough to, to, to bring him in for questioning. Upon his interview, he refused to confess to anything. So the um, police in Van Buren decided to bring in the FBI and um, state police to help them investigate. Um, he claimed that he was drunk and he remembers talking to children and offering money, but he doesn't remember anything else besides waking up the next day at home. Detective Hartley believes that Lynx is top priority and the top person of interest in the Morgan's case. Um, Jessica, who was playing with Morgan at the time, was interviewed recently and she doesn't remember any major details of the man that they saw the night that Morgan was taken, but she does remember that he was older um, and that the truck he drove was boxy. And Lynx's truck was boxy. Witness statements from June 9th, 1995 stated that the truck had a dent in the passenger side of the, of the red truck and on the, from the port reports of Lynx's truck, it also had dents on the passenger side as well. There was a witness on, from September of around September of 1995, and he stated that Lynx had a truck with a white camper on it up until a few months ago. So that would place it, you know, right after the time Morgan after Morgan's abduction. Um, at the time um, of 1995, Lynx's truck was sent to this Arkansas State Crime Lab in Little Rock. However, none of the evidence that they collected from that truck can be located. Um, Lynx passed his polygraph test and. 
once he passes polygraph test, the investigators, all the leads on Link, it ended. They stopped looking at him um, again, closely for the Morgan Nick abduction. The front bench seat in Lynx's truck had human blood on it, per reports from 1995. Um, and per reports, they also found a strain of blonde hair in the truck. Um, but DNA analysis from 27 years ago, 1995, it's not, it's not as advanced as it is currently. So they were not able to identify who it was based off DNA. Um, and all that evidence that they collected was lost. So that doesn't help anything. Um, they only have documents and reports about what they have found, what they found back in 1995. Lynx also had a shed in his backyard in 1995, and um, in 2005, investigators went back to look went back to look at Lynx, and Lynx passed at this time. He was he was already deceased. Um, they went back to the shed that was located in Lynx's backyard. That um, there's a concrete slab built or outside of that, that shed, and it was reported that he had poured that slab, that concrete slab, three days after Morgan's disappearance. So they went back, in 2005, they went back to the shed, and they never dug um, at all, and Detective Hartley and his team went back to that shed, and they dug under the concrete slab, and that was reportedly you know, poured three days after Morgan's disappearance but that dig was unsuccessful in the shed from photographs and from documents that they found um, was already there in 1990. So since it was there prior to Morgan's disappearance, they didn't find any need to dig under that shed and nothing was found under the, con under the concrete slab. Um, investigators did, however, get a break in this investigation um, when they put in the VIN number from Lynx's truck to see if it was registered currently and it was and the owner of that truck lived 30 minutes away um, from Alma so investigators you know called and set up a time and got a warrant to search the truck and get it looked at again for an, with for any forensic evidence also investigators found Lynx's ex-wife and went in to interview her as well um, per reports um, Lynx had assaulted sexually assaulted and um, raped his 11 year old granddaughter um, and that was three years before um, Morgan's abduction he was never arrested for this in 1992 he was given a 10-year SIS which is a suspended imposition of sentence which is a probation so he never served any jail time for the 92 um, assault on his granddaughter and from their interview with I believe his ex-wife she stated that she didn't feel like he could do anything like this with them, but whenever he would drink she didn't want to be around him because um, she was afraid of him and um, from her from what they found from reports she Lynx's ex-wife watched Lynx whisper something into his granddaughter's ear and she pulled her granddaughter to the side and asked her what Lynx told her and from that from what she revealed he said she contacted the little girl's the granddaughter's um, mother and told her and that's when Lynx got um, the probation investigators they went out to the home where Lynx's truck was currently at and on Lynx's truck they found markings on um, the on the outside of the bed of the truck where there was once a camper shell installed so that gave investigators a lot of hope um, because it showed that you know this was a, a red truck with, consistent with reports from Jessica Anti, and it shows that there was once a camper shell installed on that vehicle. Um, so they did a, a second forensic search of Lynx's truck. They found enough um, sample on the bench of the seat to determine that it was in fact human blood on this on the truck but they were not able to obtain DNA from the blood sample because of prolonged sun exposure and heat and the DNA has broken down at this point so the confirmatory test revealed that no DNA was present but there they found enough to be able to confirm that it was human blood found um, they also found a strain of hair in this truck as well and um, while this this strand of hair was processing in the in the labs they went back to charlie ray vine's property and um 
they took a second dog team out there. So while all this information was processing about um, Billy Jack Lynx, they went back to Charlie Ray Vines, his property, and um, went back to investigate, just double check that property again with a second dog team. Um, when Vines went to one of his victims' home, I think it was the last victim that he attacked um, in 2000, he was expecting this, this young girl's mother to be home. She was six, the little girl was 16, and th her mother was not home. So and he attacked the 16-year-old instead. It was an opportunity rather than his, his planned attack. He, it wasn't his preference, I guess you can call it, but it was an opportunity. And so therefore, it kind of leads Charlie Vines as a open but impossible sub a suspect and um, an interest in the case. And since he, you know, had an opportunity, it doesn't, you know, it can't, it doesn't rule out the possibility that he could have, you know, found an opportunity with Morgan um, as well. So you can't rule him out just yet. So they went back and they had a second dog team, but nothing was, you know, ever kind of found from that. Um, but so as they did all that and they looked back at Charlie Vines, um, Billy Jack Lynx, the hair sample came back. So they had, they sent in a comparison sample of Morgan's hair and used that to compare with the hair sample found in the truck, hopefully identifying Morgan Nick. Um, however, the hair, hair sample in the truck was inconclusive, which means it's not that it's a no and it's not that it's a negative, it, it just means that there was not enough material to detect any DNA. So similar to the blood stains, that it just wasn't enough material in there to detect any DNA to, to identify the subject. However, there was one final sample um, that they sent off to the lab. It was a, um, some fibers that they found in the truck. So investigators sent a Girl Scout shirt that was the same age and color and make and model, um, I guess you can say, as the um, shirt that Morgan Nick was last seen wearing. A, it was a, she was wearing a blue-green um, Girl Scout shirt. So the fibers, so the fibers from the mat under the seat and the, fi and the floor carpet um, mat on the driver's side and metal pieces from the carpet, padding from the driver's side, and brackets from the driver's side. All of these items had fibers that had the characteristics and optical properties that were the same as the known sample. So that blue-green cotton fiber exhibited the same microscopic and optical properties as the shirt. Similar, very, very similar to the one Morgan Nick was wearing. Um, and also another thing that they found too was that you know Lynx wore glasses and and when you look at the the composites that T Jessica and Ty made and then you look at the mugshot of Billy Jack Lynx, he looks older and they I mean the picture that Jessica and Ty made kind of makes him look like he's 20 or 30 and you look at Lynx and he looks like he's I think he's 60 or 70 then. Um, you know to a kid to eight year old and ten year old he, you know he looks older that you don't know how old old is at that age so it's kind of hard to say you know it's hard how to look at the composites that they made and identify if it is Lynx or not um and there is no um glasses on the composites and Lynx wears glasses well um both the witnesses that saw Lynx driving um not sitting in a car but driving all those reports said that he had glasses on and from reports that they found about Lynx that he had to wear corrective lenses while driving. So that strength, strengthens you know, the, their case that Lynx is possibly the, the suspect. Um, so they're asking you know, if there's anyone that has any more information about Billy Jack Lynx or even Charlie Ray Vines to please let the FBI know. Um, call it in and report it and hopefully we can bring an end to um, this you know, 20, 28 year old, almost 28 year old case and bring Morgan home. Um, another thing to remember is that there's, you know, out of all kids that are taken by strangers um, and abducted, especially after, you know, greater than two years missing, there's only a 2% chance of these kids being found alive. Um, but you have stories like, you know, JC Dugard, um, Sean Hornbeck, Elizabeth Smart, um, even Steven Stainer. I mean, there's so many cases where these kids are brought home after long-term um, abductions and long-term, you know, long-term missing child cases. 
Morgan can still be one of those two percent, you know, cases. Um, there's no reason to stop looking for Morgan alive as well. So it's important to keep looking for Morgan. It's, it's important to keep, you know, Morgan's name alive and Morgan alive. And the the point of these the the point of these stories to me and Colleen Nick talks about it in the Hulu documentary Still Missing Morgan. She's a real a real child. Um, she's she's Colleen and John Nick's daughter. She's Logan and Taryn's sister, um, big sister. Um, Morgan's an aunt now. She's got um, nieces and nephews, I believe, and she's a, a niece herself. She's got uncles and aunts, and she's a granddaughter. She's a friend. Um, she was a Girl Scout. Uh, she was an actual. She was an actual child. Like she's not just a case file. She's not just a number. She's not just a photograph of a missing child. She's an actual child. And remembering her and keeping her name alive keeps that fight alive to find Morgan. And that's the that's the primary goal here is to find Morgan and bring Morgan home and bring and give her the justice that she deserves, which is hard in a case like this where the two suspects that they're looking at are dead. Um, but hopefully, you know, putting a name to who took Morgan Nick and, and giving her, you know, what she deserves, which is either to be home with her family or have a final resting place where her mother and her brother and sister can go and visit her and be with her for once because they haven't been with Morgan in 20, 28 years almost and it's not just a true crime um, documentary series or docu-series that you know you, you binge and she's not an entertainment purpose of you know true crime gurus it's she's an actual she's an actual little girl who didn't deserve any of that um, so rem remember that when you're, you know, watching any videos on Morgan Nick and keep Morgan's name out there and keep Morgan's fight alive to, you know, bring, bring her home.